Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you all. Uh, specifically, I would, I would like to thank Professor Tadesu uh, for agreeing to share his knowledge with us. So good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Egina Francis Makwabe. I'm the Chief uh, Medical Director, uh, Africa Health Care Network in Tanzania. So uh, I'll be chairing this, uh, this session, uh, but in case if I'll be dropping out because of the internet, Dr. Tarindwa Joseph uh, from uh, Rwanda, uh, who is a consultant physician and nephrologist uh, at, in Rwanda will also be, will take over. Or Dr. Jonathan Wara from Kenya, uh, who is also a consultant nephrologist, and uh, we, uh, we might also take over if there was be, there will be any internet issues. Uh, so today's topic is development of nephrology in Ethiopia. So I'm going to hear a lot uh, from, from Professor Tadeso uh, regarding nephrology in Ethiopia. Uh, so before we proceed, I would like to read uh, his short bio. Uh, Professor Yoadwesen Tadeso Mengizpu is a senior consultant nephrologist and former Head of Reno Unit, School of Medicine, College of Health Sciences, Addis Ababa uh, University. He, he's also an associate professor, Department of Internal Medicine, uh, School of Medicine, College of Health Sciences, in Addis Ababa University. He's a former secretary and president, Ethiopia Medical Association, and a member of Advocacy Working Group uh, and Africa Region Board, ISN. Uh, Prof uh, Professor Mengistu launched uh, the first hemodialysis unit in, e in Ethiopia, and that was 2001. So, Professor Mengistu, uh, you are warmly welcome, and it's a great honor to welcome you, and please proceed. Uh, thank you, Egina, for uh, the very generous introduction. Uh, can you see my slides? Uh, no, the, I can't see the slides. Uh, I can see you. But not uh, good evening uh, again. Sorry for the technical hiccup. Uh, and thank you again, Dr. Uh, Edina, for the very generous introduction. And thank you, Dr. Vincent and the HA team for inviting me to give this talk on the development of nephrology in Ethiopia. Uh, so this is the outline of uh, my presentation. I'll give you some background information on Ethiopia, discuss the burden of kidney diseases, uh, and then talk about uh, the development of renal replacement uh, therapy in Ethiopia, and uh, wind up by discussing the challenges and prospects for renal care in Ethiopia. Uh, so this is, this is a map of uh, Ethiopia, uh, which is a country located in the area known as the Horn of Africa, uh, with several neighbors, Eritrea in the north, Sudan uh, and South Sudan in the uh, north and north, uh, uh, southwest, Kenya, Somalia, and Djibouti are other neighbors. Uh, Ethiopia is uh, the oldest independent uh, country in Africa. It's uh, landlocked. Uh, it, it has the highest landlocked, the largest landlocked population in the whole world uh, with an estimated uh, land area of 1.1 million uh, square kilometers. It's the second most populous country in Africa next to Nigeria with an estimated population of 115 million, most of which lives in the rural areas. It has a very young population with a median age of 19 uh, with 43% of the population below the age of 15. Our annual population growth rate is quite high, 2.1%, with 4.2 births per woman in the reproductive age group. Uh, Ethiopia has, uh, this, is, this is an old map, old by a few weeks. We had uh, 10 regions and two uh, city administrations until a few weeks ago. We now have an 11th region. I did not have, uh, do not have the map of the 11th region, but this is what, uh, the regions in Ethiopia uh, look like. Uh, many of you must have heard of uh, Lucy, uh, which is uh, a collection of several hundred pieces of fossilized bone. 
uh, consisting of 40% of a female of the hominid species Australopithecus afarensis, representing the oldest uh, hominid uh, so far discovered. 3.2 million years is the estimated um, time Lucy lived. She was uh, thought to be, she's believed to have been a 15 year old uh, female while uh, our ancestors were living on the trees. This is a picture of one of the rock hewn churches of uh, Lalibela, a city in North Ethiopia, uh, one of uh, the uh, national wonders of Ethiopia. Uh, and I have a picture of uh, our legendary athlete, Haile Gabra Selassie, perhaps one of the greatest long distance runners in the world who had at different times uh, 27 world records, two Olympic gold medals and several uh, uh, gold medals during the world championships. Another elite athlete, uh, Turunesh Dibaba, uh, 5,000, 10,000 meters runner with three gold medals in the Olympics. Um, coming to the subject proper, um, uh, Talking about the profile of diseases in Ethiopia, uh, the most important diseases in terms of uh, um, numbers are infectious diseases like malaria, HIV, TB, and uh, maternal and childhood diseases. These are uh, top in the list of conditions associated with morbidity and mortality in Ethiopia. But there is an increasing uh, burden of NCDs for, as causes for morbidity and mortality in Ethiopia. Uh, in a study uh, in 2019, NCDs were reported to account for about 32% of total deaths in Ethiopia. You can imagine this is not an negligible uh, proportion, although uh, it's quite small compared to the global figure of 74%. Ethiopia has developed a detailed uh, NCD strategy because of the recognition of the increasing importance of NCDs both as the causes of morbidity and mortality. Uh, in terms of uh, kidney disease in Ethiopia, uh, I'll separately talk about AKI and CKD. Because uh, we do not measure creatinine in many of our hospitals for different reasons, we miss the opportunity to diagnose AKI, so our numbers might appear uh, quite small. Uh, but where attempts to look for uh, AKI have been made, AKI is quite common in uh, hospitals. From the few hospital-based studies that are published, uh, one can note the following. Patients with AKI in Ethiopia are uh, very young, uh, less than 40 years uh, compared to patients uh, with AKI in the West. Uh, and uh, in the period from the 1980s to the 1990s when the first published papers on AKI uh, came out to the present date. There has been a shift in the causes of AKI, septic and malaria were among the top causes of AKI, whereas in more recent studies, hypovolemia, glomerulonephritis, and obstetric causes predominate. Mortality from AKI is much lower than in reports from the West. Obviously, this is not because of the better standards of care we provide, but it's because we have our patients with AKI are younger and they have fewer comorbidities than patients with AKI in the developed world. Uh, talking about chronic kidney disease, uh, there are no studies on the prevalence of uh, chronic kidney disease in Ethiopia, uh, but we know from uh, a few studies uh, uh, that the risk factors for CKD are on the rise. Uh, a very good national survey uh, that was conducted in 2015 using the World Health Organization's uh, stepwise approach uh, that uh, included about 10,000 uh, adults between the ages of 15 and 60 from uh, representative uh, places in the country showed that the uh, prevalence of uh, hypertension was 15.6% and that of diabetes 3.2%. Uh, and in hospital-based studies among patients with chronic kidney disease, hypertension uh, and diabetes uh, have been shown to be common comorbidities. And when it comes to the causes of uh, CKD, 
glomerulonephritis, diabetes and hypertension are the presumed causes for CKD and then state kidney disease. This is according to observations by uh, many of us practicing in Ethiopia. Uh, we do not do a lot of kidney biopsies, but from the few kidney biopsies we do, we see all kinds of primary uh, glomerular diseases and secondary glomerular diseases. Lupus is, is the most common secondary uh, gene that we find in the few kidney biopsies that we manage to do from time to time. Obstructive uropathy uh, is not an uncommon cause of uh, uh, CKD and state kidney disease. Uh, and urinary stone disease is a major contributor. I've been told that uh, we have more urinary stone disease than uh, our neighbors uh, down south, south like uh, Tanzania, Uganda, and so on. This is what I hear from uh, my urology colleagues. We have genetic diseases like uh, uh, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease as causes of end-stage kidney disease. The estimated prevalence of treated end-stage kidney disease is, is very low. Uh, you know, at uh, standing at 16 to 18 per million population, and even by African standards, that's that's quite low. Uh, looking at the history of renal replacement therapy in Ethiopia, uh, dialysis, both hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, were first introduced uh, some 40 years ago in the Tukurambasa Hospital, the teaching hospital of the School of Medicine at Saba University, where I currently practice. Uh, at the time, dialysis was uh, started then. It was provided uh, only for patients with presumed uh, acute kidney injury, and both hemo and peritoneal dialysis were intermittently available and uh, were not accessible to most patients who needed the services. Uh, the uh, First maintenance uh, hemodialysis uh, uh, unit was uh, uh, actually started much later in 2001. Uh, the opportunity to uh, be involved in the launching of the first maintenance unit in a private hospital in that is some 20 years ago. Uh, it took a long time before Ethiopia could do its uh, own uh, kidney transplants and uh, the first kidney transplant was done in September uh, 2015 at St. Paul Hospital, uh, another public hospital uh, in Addis Ababa, a public hospital and a teaching hospital under the St. Paul's Millennium Medical College in September 2015. So this is to show the rigid PD catheters that uh, we used to uh, do peritoneal dialysis with in the 1980s and 90s. Uh, even now, when uh, children with um, AKI come to our hospital, our pediatric nephrologists use uh, these catheters to do uh, PD. Uh, the hemodialysis machines we had uh, used um, coil dialyzers, which uh, are no longer in use. They are produced by a company in, in Japan. And we used those dialyzers for a number of years. So these are the pioneers of dialysis in Ethiopia. You'd notice uh, the uh, first person is a non-Ethiopian. He was a, a Cuban nephrologist who'd come from the Institute of uh, Nephrology in Havana, Cuba, who led the first uh, uh, da uh, nephrology team in Ethiopia, Professor Alfonso Guerra. He was soon replaced by uh, Dr. Brhano Hapte, who returned from nephrology training in uh, Glasgow and continued with the elite analysis services uh, that were uh, present then. Uh, I'll give you some uh, basic uh, uh, information on the current state of dialysis services in Ethiopia. Uh, the data uh, was collected uh, just uh, two months ago in September 2021 and, and is therefore uh, very current. Uh, uh, this was done uh, together with my young colleague, Dr. Uh, Adisumalke. Uh, we were able to uh, collect information from all the dialysis units that were in operation at the time. And we were able to uh, uh, gather that there were uh, 1,132 patients on dialysis in September, you know, bringing uh, the number of patients to 10 per million population. 
Most patients, as would be expect, expected, uh, were in Addis, giving you a, a prevalence of 175 per million population. The total number of dialysis units uh, in our survey was 35. Interestingly, the number of dialysis units is increasing by the day. I was talking to uh, a sales representative of one of the dialysis companies this morning, and I was told there are three dialysis units that have just started or are about to start after we did the survey. One has actually started about two weeks ago. Most of these patients are in private for-profit dialysis units. Uh, most, are, uh, most of the dialysis units are hospital-based, 31 of them compared to just four uh, freestanding dialysis units. The average cost of hemodialysis per session is $51. Uh, uh, but with a, with a uh, wide range from about $40 to uh, about $80 or thereabouts. Uh, most patients pay out of pocket and $51 per session is, is very, very expensive to, to even to a, a middle class uh, person in Addis Ababa. Uh, many families uh, face uh, uh, financial catastrophes when a member of the family has to uh, undergo dialysis. Uh, the city administration of Addis Ababa has in the last couple of years uh, subsidized dialysis payment for uh, patients dialysis, dialyzing in the public hospitals. Uh, we have dialysis nurses delivering dialysis uh, in all the dialysis units who do not have the category of uh, professionals called uh, dialysis technicians. The typical patient nurse to patient ratio is one to four. Most of the, the dialysis units, like you know, close to 70% have um, a nephrologist attending to these patients. Although the frequency with which these patients are seen by the nephrologist is variable. If you look at the length of dialysis sessions, interestingly, uh, three quarters uh, of the dialysis units uh, have length of dialysis uh, about four hours with, uh, with the rest as shown in the uh, uh, slide. Uh, a little less than 50% of the patients dialyze uh, uh, three times per week. You have patients who dialyze even once a week, again, reflecting uh, practice uh, across, across Africa. Uh, and Another interesting finding was the fact that uh, a large proportion of our patients have uh, AV fistulas as uh, their dialysis access, uh, with a uh, sizable population uh, still using temporary catheters. One should not uh, forget the fact that uh, many of these patients pro, uh, start dialysis with a temporary catheter and, and, then, and then shift to uh, the more permanent dialysis access. Uh, Currently, there is no access to, to peritoneal dialysis in Ethiopia. So this is a map trying to show the distribution of the hemodialysis units and the prevalence of uh, end-stage kidney disease treated per million population, 175 per million population in the capital Addis Ababa, with a number of um, regions without any dialysis services. This is Afar uh, in the Northeast, Benishan, Gulgumuz, Gambella, these are regions where there is no dialysis service whatsoever. Uh, kidney transplantation, as uh, I indicated a, a while ago, was uh, first started uh, about six years ago at uh, St. Paul's Hospital in Addis Ababa. This was a, a collaborative uh, program with the University of Michigan from the United States. It was uh, uh, it, and still is an excellent uh, example of North-South collaboration, whereby uh, the team from uh, Michigan came uh, not, uh, uh, not just to do the, the transplants, but it was uh, involved in the training of the transplant surgeons. And uh, at the time, the program came to a halt in March 2020. The local team was just about to completely take over the uh, both the medical and the surgical aspects of kidney transplantation. Uh, I've been told by my colleagues at St. Paul's that a total of 145 
living related transplants were done between uh, the time the program started in September 2015 and March 2020 when uh, it was stopped because of the uh, COVID pandemic. The short term results, as uh, indicated by one year patient and kidney survival, were excellent on a par with results in the developed world. Uh, the government paid for the perioperative costs of uh, all the patients that were transplanted at St. Paul's, uh, but patients had to pay, uh, have to pay out of pocket for their medicines after the first two or three months. Although the government uh, paid for the perioperative costs, the financing scheme is still unclear. Um, there is uh, uh, very little to indicate that this is going to continue in the same way because there is no uh, clear uh, guide on, on how the uh, transplant program is going to be financed. As, as I said uh, a little while ago, the transplant program has been on hold since March 2020. Initially, it was because of COVID-19 and subsequently it's because of lack of uh, logistics, I mean some, some consumables. I'm, I'm, I'm told by my colleagues at St. Paul's again that uh, the program will, will uh, start uh, very soon. Uh, interestingly, uh, transplants have been done without a transplant act. We do not have a transplant act. Although transplant is mentioned in, in the health law uh, that was promulgated by uh, parliament some years ago, the health law is uh, under uh, revision and uh, it's hoped that uh, the health law that will come out will have a more expanded uh, uh, portion on uh, renal trans on, on transplants in general, including, including cadaveric transplants. But uh, practice thus, thus far has been guided by a directive from the Federal Ministry of Health. Uh, and uh, a committee at the uh, Federal Ministry of Health has been uh, carefully looking at uh, the uh, donors at, uh, you know, the, at uh, St. Paul's Hospital. So what has so far been done has been done uh, in the most uh, ethical way. Uh, in addition to the patients who've been transplanted at St. Paul's, we have several hundred patients with kidney transplants who've been uh, who've done, uh, with transplants that were done elsewhere on follow-up, uh, both at St. Paul's and uh, uh, across uh, the nephrologists uh, in town. Uh, India was and is still the most popular destination for uh, kidney transplant candidates. Uh, fortunately, uh, uh, we do not think there has been a lot of uh, uh, commercial transplants uh, going from Ethiopia. Uh, the uh, medical boards that uh, are uh, given the uh, legal rights to uh, send patients abroad uh, make uh, uh, attempts to ensure that uh, the donors that accompany, the potential donors that accompany patients are, are related. So that probably is not a major issue. Turkey is the new entrant. We have now a few patients going to Turkey following the uh, close down of India during the COVID pandemic. In terms of the supply of drugs, um, generic immunosuppressives are available, uh, but the supply situation is always precarious. Patients being given um, medicines lasting them for a month or so when they come from uh, you know, uh, very far places. Uh, uh, although we've not had interruption in uh, drug supply, the situation has, has, has uh, remained uh, precarious. So this is Dr. Uh, uh, Momina Mohammed, uh, the nephrologist who uh, led the uh, transplant efforts at uh, uh, St. Paul's Hospital when uh, it started. She is uh, a friend and colleague to, uh, to most of uh, the nephrologists in Ethiopia. Uh, when it comes to human resource development, the first Ethiopian nephrologist came back from training in the United States in 1971. You may ask me what 
nephrology was at the time even in the United States. Uh, I do not really know, but he came back from uh, the US uh, after training in Kansas, but unfortunately died uh, from an accident soon afterwards. I do not think he practiced any nephrology to speak of. Uh, then in the years 1978, when the second nephrologist came back from training again from the US, in 1991, a few nephrologists trickled into the country after training abroad, but the numbers remained uh, below 10 until 2011. I think I count as number six or seven in the list of nephrologists in Ethiopia. Uh, it is, uh, I would like you to note that the International Society of Nephrology supported the training of uh, four of the early nephrologists in Ethiopia, myself included. Um, the, the development of human resources take, uh, took a, a, a very uh, important turn in 2015 when St. Paul's Indian Medical College started the first local fellowship program and subsequently um, my school of medicine uh, the, in the Addis Ababa University started the second uh, uh, t t fellowship program in nephrology. We presently have 30 nephrologists in Ethiopia including uh, five pediatric nephrologists. Most of these nephrologists practice nephrology although there are a few who, who do just uh, uh, general internal medicine. Uh, we have 13 trainees presently in the two fellowship programs. So if you ask me uh, about the numbers in uh, a year or two, we'll be talking about 40, 50. So that's, that's uh, a great development uh, for, for Ethiopian nephrology. We unfortunately did not, do not have any formal training for dialysis nurses and technicians. We had uh, a dialysis nurses training program in my hospital in the 1980s, 90s it uh, faded away for uh, different reasons. And uh, St. Paul's Hospital, from my understanding, is planning to launch a dialysis nurses program very soon. And we're very keen for that to start so that our dialysis units are, uh, are staffed by properly trained nurses. Uh, so this is what um, the practice of nephrology looks like in Ethiopia. Uh, I would like to uh, spend a few minutes talking about the challenges of uh, nephrology practice in Ethiopia. Uh, so we have uh, acute kidney injury uh, as a major problem, uh, at least in the uh, hospitals in the urban areas, and that's, that's a major challenge. We have uh, the um, diseases like malaria, diarrheal diseases in children, uh, obstetric causes of AKI, including hypertensive disease of pregnancy, and uh, this uh, imposes a burden for uh, our nephrologists. Uh, it, it is interesting to note that uh, the dialysis programs that are uh, present in the uh, urban areas in Ethiopia, including Addis Ababa, are primarily focused on provision of dialysis to patients with end-stage kidney disease, uh, uh, and uh, it's only a few hospitals that really uh, cater for patients with AKI. I have already mentioned that uh, there is factors for uh, chronic kidney disease, like diabetes and hypertension are on the rise. We have studies to indicate that uh, hypertension had a very low prevalence in uh, Ethiopia, uh, you know, less than 5% only 40 years ago. We now have a national prevalence of 15.6% according to the national survey done uh, just five years ago. And in uh, small pockets in urban areas in Ethiopia, the prevalence is as high as 30%. So that's, that's frightening. Uh, rise in the uh, prevalence of diabetes is another frightening factor. And these combined, there is no question that we're going to be overwhelmed by uh, patients with CKD and state, uh, and, uh, and state kidney disease. Although I, I keep on talking about the increasing uh, burden, uh, our inability to provide uh, you know, the authorities with studies to show the burden of kidney disease is another challenge. 
uh, without presenting the authorities who decide on the finances how uh, prevalent kidney diseases are we're not likely to get uh, the finances needed to uh, to to run our places uh, although ncds are uh, having have, are, are gaining uh, attention increasingly the absence of a policy and strategy to address the increasing burden of kidney disease in my opinion is a challenge uh, one cannot uh, uh, discuss uh, the development of services in a policy vacuum, and, and that's a major challenge to us. I have uh, already alluded to the lack of a sustainable financing scheme for renal uh, replace, uh, replacement therapy in Ethiopia. Most patients on uh, uh, dialysis, uh, uh, you know, they, they sell their houses, they, have, uh, you know, they, they, they face a catastrophic uh, financial burden. It's not unusual for any driver in Addis Ababa to uh, see uh, the relatives of patients begging for uh, money for dialysis in the streets while, while driving in Addis. So, so that's something we have to address. On the positive side, uh, we know we, the fact that the government uh, uh, at the central and regional level through the Federal Ministry of Health and the regional health bureaus is increasing to attention to uh, non-communicable disease is, uh, is, uh, is an encouraging development. We have an NCD policy, an NCD strategy in place, uh, and that's very encouraging. We uh, believe that that will uh, uh, um, you know, help us to develop uh, policy and strategy specific to kidney diseases, and so that's a positive development. And there is increasing public pressure for the provision of dialysis uh, services. This is going to uh, do quite well. Uh, you know, politicians listen to patients more than they listen to us, and the public pressure uh, is going to um, result in a positive development for nephrology in Ethiopia. Uh, we do not have a, a well-running uh, health insurance scheme to speak of in Ethiopia. But the government has been piloting what it calls a community health insurance scheme, particularly in the rural areas, with expansion to Addis Ababa and uh, other urban areas recently. Uh, the, uh, what is covered by the community health insurance scheme is, is quite limited, but there are efforts to widen the scope of coverage uh, of, of these services. And this would hopefully include provision of services to patients with kidney disease, at least treatment of diabetes, hypertension, and, and, and medicines that can slow the, prog the progression of CKD. The growing private sector is, is a, is a you know, positive development. Uh, the private sector is, uh, this is the private for-profit sector. It's interested not only in uh, dialysis, it's also interested in transplantation. So, in a few years, we may have um, private transplant centers, although some of us have some misgivings about that possibility. In any case, that's, that's generally a positive, a positive trend. Uh, the growing number of nephrology professionals from 10 only uh, uh, 10 years ago to 30 plus, uh, this is going to change the face of nephrology in Ethiopia. Uh, we've been very slow uh, in trying to form a professional society, uh, but we'll hopefully launch uh, the Ethiopian Society of Nephrology sometime in 2022. Uh, and as seen in uh, uh, other parts of Africa, professional societies are, are very helpful in, uh, in um, uh, changes in uh, uh, services. So that's, that's a positive development. And there are early moves to coordinate efforts among patient associations, which have been pushing the government in the direction of dialysis, um, which is not the only thing we want to do, but there are moves to coordinate the efforts among the associations and nephrologists to influence policy and strategy directions of the Federal Ministry of Health. So these are positive developments. I'd like to pay a tribute to the pioneers in nephrology in this talk, and this include uh, the first uh, person who came back as a nephrologist uh, to Ethiopia, Dr. Arbasu Tafarra, who unfortunately died uh, without doing a lot of nephrology work. 
Professor Alfonso Guerra, who did the first uh, hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis uh, as a leader of the team of nephrologists from the Institute of uh, Nephrology in Havana, Cuba, who introduced dialysis in Ethiopia for the first time, and Dr. Burhan Dalit, Dr. Burhan Hapte, who uh, came just a year after the start of the dialysis uh, services from uh, uh, Glasgow and uh, taught nephrology and uh, did dialysis in the hospital. Professor Salara Devi Naika, uh, whose picture you see here and who uh, gave the lecture in this series last week, uh, was a teacher to some of us, including myself. Uh, and she, she is an excellent mentor and uh, role model and has uh, uh, contributed uh, very much to the development of nephrology in Ethiopia by training those of us who are in uh, leadership positions in uh, nephrology in Ethiopia. <clears throat> Before uh, I wind down, in the few minutes that are left, I feel I have an obligation as an Ethiopian to say a few words about uh, the current situation in Ethiopia to an African audience. Uh, as you know, Ethiopia has always been top of the news when it comes to news about Africa, good news, bad news. Uh, Ethiopia is hailed as the cradle of humankind. I've shown you a picture of uh, uh, Lucy and we have a lot of archeologic finds findings to indicate that uh, the whole human race is Ethiopian. That's where we started. Ethiopia is among the earliest civilizations in the world. It's the only African country that has never been colonized. So these are good news we've been hearing about Ethiopia. But uh, news from Ethiopia has not always been good. Uh, many people remember the drought and famine 1973-1974, whereby about one million Ethiopians perished from drought in the 20th century. When the repeat of the same situation in 1984-85, some of you may remember the uh, artists who uh, sang the song, Do They Know It's Christmas, uh, back in the 80s again to help uh, uh, victims of drought and famine in Ethiopia. Things appear to change for the better. In the 1990s, uh, uh, 2000s, 2010s, so Ethiopia from about 2000 to 2018, Ethiopia's economy was hailed as the fastest growing economy in Africa. Ethiopia became a darling of the West uh, with a sitting US president in the person of the first black president, President Barack Obama, visiting Ethiopia for the first time in July 2015. And in April 2018, uh, there were democratic reforms in Ethiopia following widespread protests against the incumbent government. And our new prime minister was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in December 2019. Uh, sadly, however, since uh, November 2020, Ethiopia has been in the news for the wrong reasons. War, genocide, ethnic cleansing is what you hear about Ethiopia. Ethiopia is uh, uh, vilified by the media that uh, portrays it as a country uh, on the verge of collapse. Mm, the situation, however, is different. Uh, uh, true. Uh, we are in very turbulent times. We are uh, uh, in a state of uh, civil war, uh, a term uh, some, of, some people uh, do not like, but we are, we are in a civil war, definitely. But I would like to assure you that uh, Ethiopia is still going strong. As a fellow African tweeted just a week ago, there will be twists and turns lows and highs, but as surely as the sun rises from the east and sets to the west, Ethiopia will come out of this conflict stronger and with that uh, set a new momentum of resistance to neocolonialism as it did in the past.
Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd be pleased to uh, take questions, obviously not political questions. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Tadesi. Uh, you and Essen Mengist. Uh, that was excellent talk. And um, it's the time for questions and answers. And um, maybe I should, uh, should start by asking you some couple of questions, uh, Dr. Tadesi. Um, how is the PD programs uh, in, in Ethiopia? And uh, another question is, um, you have the training program, um, fellowship program now for nephrologists. Uh, I would like to know um, how many years does it take for a nephrologist, I mean, for the training of, for one to become a nephrologist? And um, yeah, and yeah, and for dialysis technicians and uh, uh, nursing, uh, is there any plan for you to start anytime soon? Thank you. Okay, uh, so le let me uh, address your questions before uh, before other questions come up. It, uh, unfortunately, we have no PD program in Ethiopia. Um, as when we started uh, dialysis in Ethiopia in the 1980s, we used to do acute PD using those rigid characters that uh, I projected. Uh, about uh, nine or ten years ago, uh, I was fortunate to be part of the Saving Young Lives of uh, the uh, project of the ISN, which provided us with support for PD. So for a few years, we were able to do PD, particularly for uh, patients uh, uh, with uh, uh, pediatric uh, uh, you know, kidney failure, uh, uh, primarily acute, but uh, we've not had any supplies for PD um, you know, in the last many years, our uh, uh, pediatric uh, colleagues struggled to uh, get uh, PD characters from here and there, and they use uh, improvised uh, intravenous fluid to, uh, to do PD. Uh, this is done, as you know, in many other parts of uh, Africa too. But unfortunately, we've not uh, had, uh, uh, we, we do not have a, uh, an ongoing PD program. And you know, because the renal replacement therapy in Ethiopia, as I repeatedly emphasize, uh, is, uh, is, is occurring in a policy vacuum, there is nobody in Ethiopia that's, uh, you know, really uh, focused on doing PD. Some NGOs have, have tried to introduce PD. Um, um, I've been talking of introducing PD, but, uh, you know, that has not come to fruition. Our fellowship programs are both fellowship programs at the two different hospitals uh, are for two years. And uh, in both programs, there is an inbuilt uh, uh, visit to uh, better endowed uh, units uh, outside of Ethiopia, but it's a two year program for those with um, uh, an internal medicine specialty certificate. We do not have programs to uh, train dialysis technicians or dialysis nurses. All the nurses in the dialysis units, uh, the 30 plus dialysis units are uh, uh, nurses that are trained on the job. Uh, I believe St. Paul's program, which is, which is the strongest you know, renal program as things stand at present, is thinking of uh, developing a program for nurses. And we've been discussing that this is something we can do together, hopefully. Uh, sometime uh, next year, we'll be able to start a uh, training program for nurses. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. That was uh, very good answers. So, uh, Dr. Bima, I've, I've seen your, your hand. Professor Bima. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Jan. Sorry, I have to leave at six. But uh, thank you so much for that very enlightening presentation and to show us what's going on in Ethiopia. Uh, I think, uh, you know, you're not alone in this. Many of the other countries are facing, facing similar challenges. And I must tell you, in South Africa, we're not very far off. We're going to be facing those challenges very soon as well, uh, although we are a little better off. I just have one question for you. With regards to the pediatric uh, program, you said you had five pediatric nephrologists. I know one of them, but um, have there been any uh, move towards doing uh, chronic dialysis? I mean, 
dialysis or even a transplant in pediatrics? Not to my, no, there are no, there are, you know, bigger kids have been dialyzed in the uh, adult okay. unit. Bigger kids are dialyzed. So you just stick to adolescents, right? Yes. No, no uh, chronic, uh, you know, maintenance dialysis for pediatric patients. We have a few uh, pediatric uh, transplants done elsewhere, but the St. Paul's program, as it is a new uh, program, has uh, not, uh, you know, ventured into uh, pediatric uh, transplants. But as as we gain experience, I'm sure this is something we're uh, sure. uh, going to venture into. Yeah, not Thank you very much. Sorry, I I have to exit now because I've got to... Thank you Thank so you much Bill. for that lovely lecture. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So I have also seen the hand from uh, Dr. Lloyd. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Teresi, for the beautiful, uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, you know, there's a lot, uh, there are a lot of strong points here I see, see on the developing a transplant program uh, and also a training program that you have developed. That's also really nice. Uh, I just want to know on this transplant program, this is uh, to me uh, definitely a unique model across Africa because uh, you've had a foreign team coming in on a constant basis. And finally, you've got a team within in house which is sort of developed to, and able to take on transplants themselves. So, does this in house team have any training outside or were, or they, were they fully trained? Uh, with these visits that you know occurred with people coming from outside, how, how did this in-house training, uh, in-house team develop? Uh, with, uh, so that's one thing uh, I would like to know. And what is the rough cost of transplant? You know, in-house when you've actually started transplants on, on an average, yes, the government would have funded, but uh, a rough cost if you can give me. Uh, this is two questions. The third of the training program. How many uh, students you are trained per year now, and how many centers, and what would be the cost? Like, sorry for these questions. Yeah, yeah. Lovely presentation. I, I, I really appreciate a lot of strengths as well, and, and that's what we have to look at. Thank you, Doctor Doctor Vincent. Um, yes, the the surgeons were trained in house. Uh, there are four surgeons. I know they were sent elsewhere for purpose of exposure, just to see how, how things are done in, in better end our centers. But it was done in-house. This was a uniquely uh, dedicated team of uh, transplant nephrologists from uh, uh, transplant uh, surgeons from the University of Michigan, uh, led by uh, Professor uh, Jeff Punch, who used to come every month for a week and uh, do the transplants both uh, with the um, uh, fellows on, uh, on training, uh, both the uh, uh, donor nephrectomy and the transplant would be done by him with them assisting. And so I would say uh, they were uh, trained fully in-house, although they were exposed to uh, centers abroad. And at the time the transplant uh, uh, program stopped, they were uh, they had literally take on, uh, taken over. He would be around in theater, but they were doing the surgery. So it was unfortunate that just a few months before he was uh, going to let them loose, uh, the transplant program because of uh, COVID-19. Cost is something I would be hard pressed to answer. Um, the Ministry of Health itself uh, does not, uh, you know, has not given us uh, how much, uh, you know, it costs uh, for uh, the transplants uh, to to happen. So I have really no idea how how much uh, how much it, it costs both not only for the transplants but the, the training program. We're not very good at, uh, uh, you know, adding our numbers expenses. That's what people, poor people are poor at. If you are poor, you don't really. Uh, do your accounting properly. That's something we must we must uh, we must do. Um, the training programs we take uh, about two to three uh, trainees per uh, per year. Uh, so uh, so the uh, program at Saint Paul's, which started uh, a little earlier than ours, would take two two three every year. Same thing would uh, would would happen to us. So. Uh, you know, combined, you would have uh, you know 10, 12 trainees at uh, at uh, at one at one time. That's the most we can take. 
Uh, somebody asked, uh, you know, made, made comments about pathology. This is something I did not mention. It's, it's pathetic that we have uh, very little renal pathology to speak of. Um, the transplant program was, was uh, very helpful in uh, uh, training one young uh, pathologist who was doing quite well. Uh, he was uh, doing uh, both light and, um, and immuno studies uh, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, to, with a reasonable, uh, reasonable proficiency. Uh, I'm not sure if he's still in, in country, as happens in Ethiopia. Um, I haven't heard about him the last several months. I, I've heard uh, news that he may not be in Ethiopia. So that's something we have to develop. Uh, nephrology without uh, renal pathology is, is meaningless. And uh, that's why we're, our uh, biopsy numbers are, are very few. We are forced to send uh, uh, biopsy samples uh, abroad, mostly to India. We get very good uh, you know, results from India, but uh, you know, that cannot replace uh, the development of a local pathology program. So that's, that's something we must, really, uh, we must really work on. Other questions, somebody asked uh, who covers the cost? Yeah. The cost is, 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 is covered, has been covered by the government. Uh, HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis B. Ah, my, my colleagues at St. Paul have to help me. But from what I know, you know, I was present when the guidelines were uh, being developed. Uh, HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C uh, were exclusion criteria just until the transplant uh, program gained adequate experience. That was my understanding. I stand to be corrected by my colleagues if they are in the, uh, uh, in the Zoom meeting. Um, Professor, that was very good answers. Um, is there any uh, other question from the audience? Somebody asked why twice weekly? Finances, my dear. I am, these are patients who beg to pay for dialysis. So it's mm -hmm. not because uh, we have, uh, you know, things like incremental dialysis and so on, plan. It's just people come the number of times they can afford to pay. That's, that's the reason we'd like. Most of them would, uh, would definitely need uh, three times a week. It's because of finances. All right. I've seen the, the hand from Dr. Joseph Talindua, uh, who is uh, from Rwanda. Dr. Joseph? Good afternoon. And good afternoon, uh, Dr. Tadesa. You've done a wonderful presentation when you're talking about Ethiopia. And it's what's, what, what seems amusing to me is that um, although I think almost everybody knows it, Ethiopia is a crowd of mankind, but here the genocide that was taking place in Rwanda, they were, they were putting us in the river Nile. You know, sending them back to Ethiopia where they came from. It looks like now if there's genocide anywhere in the world, we're asking them to go back to Ethiopia. Yeah, but what's going on today, of course, is I, I know Ethiopia, it's not the first time Ethiopia has gone through this. I, I'm sure you're going to imagine you've got an, an, a system that is very established over a thousand years, and uh, we are praying for you. You are going to get out of it. Now, um, I'm interested. But you know, particularly in the, the fellowship program, by the way, I think uh, uh, Ahmed Momina is, is here in Rwanda, and I think uh, she's brought an idea of uh, training fellows. But I would like to tap your experience. I would like to tap your experience. I think when I went for, for my training in South Africa, you were just leaving. Uh, you, you, were just, uh, you were just leaving as I was coming in, but I think you know what involves uh, you know, fellowship training in, in, in nephrology. Now, my concern here today, in fact, as we are saying now, we can get started and improve as we go along. But I would like to know how you solve some of these problems, some of the problems already I'm seeing that we're going to face as we start training fellows. Now, we don't have a very established, I mean, a peritoneal dialysis program. Uh, of course, uh, transplantation program, we have done a few, but is not continuous. Uh, and the other yeah. thing is, uh, you know, renal pathology. I think, you know, you, you know, in, in, in Johannesburg, and Professor Nike, whom we have already mentioned, uh, I, 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 let me also mention uh, Professor uh, Stuart Gucci every Wednesday afternoon. 
you know, looking at those in the slides that actually helped me to get started when I came here. It looks like most of the time I was reading the slides with the help of a general pathologist and would come up with some diagnosis uh, to work upon. So now, since you don't seem to have a renal pathology system, you don't have a renal diary system, even the transplant system, I, I, maybe I'd like to ask how many do you do in a month? Uh, and, and could this be enough for training fellows? And how 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 are you going through this? Let me again remind Professor Biman that I'm very grateful. Actually, you gave you gave this so far. Some of, when you get started, some of these uh, is what we have. You 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 can also come in. And uh, um, I think maybe uh, Professor, can you tell us how you, you know you are solving some of these problems as far yes, as training yes. is concerned? Yes, Joseph, yeah. you are right. You are can right. I, can I say a few words? Can I say yeah. a few words? So sorry, okay. so, uh, very sorry. You, uh, Dr. Narendra, I think, uh, let me go back to India. In 1989, we had been in the exact same situation in, in the south of India. And we, in 1981, we had no dialysis in the city of Bangalore. Uh, let me tell you, we had no kidney biopsy pathologist till the late 90s. We had uh, transplantation starting in the late 80s. And there was no tissue typing laboratory in the city. We would actually send it outside the city. And this is how we started. But let me tell you today, we have about 100 plus dialysis centers of good quality dialysis in the city, 100 nephrologists in the city. Uh, and, and transplant centers are many. Uh, molecular typing centers are many. We can train any amount of people from anywhere in Africa uh, to any extent. So let me tell you, this is a very, this is not a major issue. Let us get started. I think that's the key here. You have to get started. Once you get started, this will fall in place. If you see the development of nephrology in Africa, in Ethiopia itself, it has developed to a very great extent. See, they've got a great training program. They've got a transplant program, which is now, and you know, they've got good transplant surgeons. So it won't be difficult for them to get into the whole program. So this the, uh, pathology is nothing. It's just a question of sending two people, youngsters, as they have already been sending into India for, for a year of training each, and they are back into full-scale good pathology. And a little more training from the West, they go in for EM and things like that. And even that's available in India. So I can be very honest with you that this is nothing. They, they are really in a very good situation, and they can easily you know, overcome these things without a problem. So now, for example, a training program that they, they may lack something in training program, but it's easy for them to send uh, their candidates, as, as, as mentioned, just now for a little time to get those no that, that bit of uh, information and knowledge that they need to have. And, and that will change the game altogether. I think they are doing extremely well. And, and the same, I, I would say, applies to Rwanda. I think the key is to get started. And once it gets started, it will just move. So I can tell you, that, uh, and I'm very proud to say in Bangalore now, we have 100 plus nephrologists in the city. And, and wonderful discussions that go on in every institution. So, and in fact, we have had people, we've had lovely students from, you know, wonderful, hardworking people from Ethiopia who have trained in, in India, in, in Velour, in, in St. John's, in, 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 in Bangalore as well. So this just to add on, I'm saying that a lot is done and the what is to be done can easily be done, provided we pitch away at it. Thank you so much. This is just my little, uh, my few cents of, you know, past what I've seen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much, Dr. Lloyd, for yeah. enc encouragement. Well, by the way, we already have a renal pathologist, by the way. Uh, again, cuts of BS, and they, they trained for him for one year, and I think all we need is just, uh, you know, to, to get a system established. So, but, yeah. uh, but, but I think, uh, you know, already, by the way, you, you, you even encouraged me, actually, when you said, no, let's get started and improve. And that is actually the concept you're operating upon. We start and we improve on what is, what, you know, improve on the deficit that is already there. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Vincent, for, uh, for coming to my rescue. That is the spirit with which we should work. We start and, and, and improve as we go along. Uh, all the uh, fellows who've completed their training have had uh, exposure in better centers abroad. The St. Paul's uh, uh, fellows uh, were in different hospitals in India, I believe, uh, CMC Velour, St. John's, and so on. So they have had uh, exposure to renal pathology, and our fellow, you know, uh, was in Toronto for a limited period of time. And so uh, we, 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 we can um, get our fellows exposed to 
uh, better places for a limited period of time. And in a few years, we'll have the core uh, faculty and, uh, and um, uh, consumable supplies to ensure that we have uh, a fully in-house program. So that's, that's the way we should, uh, we should go. And that's the way the Ethiopian programs in nephrology, as well as in other uh, specialties in medicine and surgery have, have developed over the years. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. <coughs> Tades, um, for very good answers. Uh, we'll take a few, two or more uh, questions and then uh, we'll allow Dr. Tades to continue with his other duties. Any other comments or questions? All right, so if there's no any questions, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Professor Tadese. That was wonderful presentations, a uh, lot of comments, a lot of com compliments from the, from the audience. <clears throat> Professor Tadese, that was very wonderful and beautiful uh, presentation. We really appreciate for your time and preparing uh, this presentation. Uh, I'd like also to thank everyone who attended this session. So we have come to an end of our presentation today and uh, we'll continue next uh, Thursday as usual with a different presentation. And uh, thank you for your time. And uh, Dr. Lloyd, if you have uh, just the last comment to Dr. Uh, Tadesi. Thank you very much, Dr. Tadesi. It's a wonderful program and I'm sure you all will great, great heights. Uh, we really look forward to interacting again. We'd love to have you on board talking to us again, and more of you all from Ethiopia to join in. Uh, we would love to have you all speaking to us as well. Thank you so much again for your time. It was a wonderful session. Thank you.